NBCC exam. Uh, now we will be a lecture as a civil engineer, right? Mechanical engineer, sorry. And up next we have uh, Mr. Chotra Zoninu. Uh, he is going to be the assistant professor of economics. We want to congratulate them and may God bless both of them. Uh, now we'll have the questions are so uh, we'll give to the audience if there is anyone who wants to ask any questions. Today's orientation uh, is nicely, I mean, a very uh, encouraging, and I think uh, men's uh, speech of uh, here before the second year of uh, yeah, been <laughs> given a very good breakfast. Yeah, mm, I just uh, wanted to encourage since uh, like most of the time, like uh, coaching centers, home studies, as we prepare, like it confuses us. So I just want to know, like, what is the presentation in this? If you want to give a percentage of preparation, like, how, what, how much percentage will you give, like, taking coaching centers and then self preparation? That, like, I hope you are getting like the amount of effort needed to depend to like break the exams or. That's, uh, I think that's fairly relevant and uh, of course we have taken coaching but uh, like I had mentioned earlier I think a self-study is more important so if I have to just give a percentage then uh, from my personal experience I would say around 40 60 40 coaching and 60 percent uh, self-study because uh, coaching definitely gives us that guidance and that um, it shows us where to go what we should study but if uh, we're relying only on coaching, then uh, it, I don't think it's sufficient. So I think uh, our, our own personal preparation, our self-study, I think this uh, will have more weightage. So just roughly, I would say 40, 60. Yes, I think it's easy for I would just agree with her that um, look, I've taken both coaching as well as spent a lot of time self-study. Um, so when you are, if you uh, have decided you're going to go for coaching, then give your everything, say 100%, and then give your 100% for self-study as well. I think it's always possible to balance it, but uh, like she said, you can do it 40-60. It's just that try to get the best out of coaching, but like she said and like we mentioned earlier, coaching is not the end in itself. You just have to come back home and do a lot of your homework. So give your best in that as well. Thank you. If there is any more. Uh, first of all, big congratulations to both Miss Lerutong and Miss Pautela. And I'm uh, very thankful to Navy Academy for hosting this session. So my question is uh, regarding current affairs. So for current affairs for NPSC, did you uh, prepare it differently with uh, regard to UPSC or did you follow the same material? Uh, I think for both of us it will be a little similar because we were focusing entirely on UPSC. And so if you are studying for UPSC and you're covering current affairs, then it's very comprehensive. It's almost enough for NPSC also. Like she said, she followed Vision, street, vision uh, 365. I did the same. I followed Vision IS, like both the monthly sources as well as the PT365 and 365. But having said that, for NPSC, uh, say around 10 or 20%, I had to specifically focus on NPSC because for prelims and NPSC, some of 
the questions are so factual that just UPSC preparation, you will not be able to solve those questions. So the 80% UPSC related, all those vision IES materials. For 20%, uh, I followed these uh, online sources, Pakistan NCQs for biology and physics and chemistry. And I had very little time to prepare. So what I did was, I would just go to the website, check the MCQs, and just screenshot it and keep it in my phone. That's how I would revise it. And then for uh, the latest current affairs, based on the PYQs, I would just do a little bit of Googling, like latest who is who, something like that. Um, but I think for NPSC, you will always have materials from coaching institutes. I think target NPSC is also um, I mean, there are many coaching institutes which do give out their own materials. I did not uh, access those resources, but I know my friends who have and have benefited. So you can always cover that as well. But that's like 20% of it. Okay. <coughs> um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll also uh, share something. Uh, even for me, I did uh, study the NPSC NPSC current affairs. Yes, uh, I also uh, didn't uh, prepare separately for current affairs, but I remember when I was preparing for mains, uh, I also read this uh, nagalandgk.com website. They have uh, some previous year questions and some important things in the news. So that's one extra source that I referred. So for NPSC current affairs, it was uh, just, you know, when we're at home, we just go through the newspaper sometimes, or when we're just scrolling through, say, Instagram pages, we come across these uh, Morum Express newspapers. So uh, when you just come across these things, they stay in your mind sometimes. So uh, I didn't have any extra preparation like that, but uh, it would be those things, I would say. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Maverick Sagetu, for this wonderful opportunity. I have uh, my question is I have so many questions to ask. Like studies have shown that the human brain can give a certain information for four days at a maximum, and people say like revision is the key to grade any exam. But with lots of lots and lots of subjects to cover, and with lots and lots of information to keep up in our brain and to keep up with the pace of revising again and again, uh, and especially with time constraints. So how, how would we manage that in PT? Thank you. For revision, uh, I guess uh, revision is really important because uh, if we're not revising it, obviously it tends to uh, miss our memory. So uh, for me, my revision strategy would be, uh, I used to make it subject-wise. So if I have read polity, say I have read uh, certain subjects, certain topics in polity, then after finishing one full round of uh, preparation in my first round, I would uh, keep another round for revision. So uh, I think some people tend to have, say, some keeping Sunday or one day in a particular number of days for revision. But uh, my strategy is that I used to go for rounds. So it just depends on uh, what amount of time I have left. So firstly, reading all those uh, uh, reading all those resources and then keeping specific time just based on our own schedule for revising. So uh, before prelims, I made sure that I was revising at least three times, uh, the entire uh, syllabus at least three times. So it's, uh, it didn't matter when I was doing it, but I, was, I just made sure that I would do it. So uh, the time can depend on you, on your own uh, timetable, your own strategy, but uh, make sure that you're revising regularly. And the same thing I followed for means also. So uh, in my mind, I just made sure, and I wrote in front of my table that I have to revise it minimum three times. So first round of revision, we tend to uh, just get a very hazy idea about what we're preparing. But then when we're going for the second round, then uh, it gets solidified in our brain. 
And then when we're going for another round, say third round or fourth round, then it stays in our mind. So uh, make sure that you're revising a number of times, just uh, set, say a limited set number of times. So uh, my revision strategy would be that. Just to add to what she said, uh, for me, I used to make a chart and then I would just make it into boxes and then I would write a subject, like say quality, economy, history, and then say within history also I'll break it down. Ancient history, medieval history, modern history, art and culture. So just make a chart and then uh, make boxes and based on the number of times that I need to revise, I, I would just tick it. So that way uh, I know which subject I need to revise, uh, which within the, the subject also, for example, if I need to pay more uh, attention to modern history. So they, so I keep the charts just to make it manageable. And like she said, usually uh, Saturdays or Sundays for revision, but it's not always possible. Like sometimes on Saturday also you want to do a new topic. And sometimes when you are, like say my Thursdays that I mentioned earlier, when I don't want to study, that's when I can pick up maybe revising. But the chart it was always very helpful because some subjects and within the subject, some topic, you might have to revise a little more than the others. Um, and even say, for example, uh, within polity also, some chapters have more weightage in the sense that UPSC or the NPSC, they tend to focus on those areas, like the fundamental rights, GPSC, that you have to know it, like every single word is important, every single article is important. So I just make the chart, just keep it in front of me so that I know which areas I need to study. And sometimes when I don't want to do anything, then I would just, based on that, I will revise. That's how I manage it. Yeah. One last question. Like most parents and relatives, they think that a success can be achieved overnight, which is not true. And as they have so much expectations from from us, and uh, such expectations are so depressing at times, it takes a toll of our mental mental health. And then if uh, they have this kind of syndrome, like mano neighbors can't see Fabiola, what people will think of my children if they don't crack in the first attempt. So. Uh, and they start, like my parents, uh, my relatives, they start comparing me with other successful candidates, uh, other successful uh, aspirants. So uh, how to like break this barrier and how to let them know and understand the civil service journey or is it the communication gap that I'm not able to keep up with my parents and relatives? Thank you. First, I would say that if your parents believe in you or say they expect something out of you, then that's a good sign. It shows that they trust you have the ability uh, to make it. Um, so I can only speak from my own experience. And for me, I have had very supportive parents. Even when I could not believe in myself, they believed in me. So in that sense, I think my story is a little bit different. Um, having said that, I think, uh, at the end, it's our own journey, no matter what our parents say. Even if they force you so much or they don't force you at all, we have to make our own choices at the end. So if you're really, if you're really into civil services, then uh, you, at one point or the other, you have to shut yourself out or you have, to, uh, you have to come to a position where what other people are saying is not affecting you anymore. Um, secondly, mm, Mem also addressed it earlier, you can always have a plan B or a plan C. That way, a little bit of burden or a little bit of pressure will also be reduced. And I think if your parents see you uh, working so hard, not just, for, not, not just for your plan A, but also for your plan B, plan C, then I think over a point of time, they will also come to understand. But on your part also, they have to see that fire burning and then just pursuing that. Um, I think I'm not able to help you much here because from my experience, it has always been supportive. Yeah, so that's all I can say. I also um, share some little things. Um, I also, uh, adding to what Steve said, uh, everyone has a, a different story. So my challenges, the background that I come from, or 
the experiences that I face, it's going to be different from somebody else. So I think, uh, of course, uh, mm -hmm. it's a reality and uh, it's a fact that people are going to have expectations from us and that pressure is definitely going to be, uh, be, uh, be, be on us. It's a given. But uh, from our own side, I think we have to uh, just gradually learn to be resilient from our own side and, uh, so, uh, and you know, interact with people who are supportive, whether it's parents or whether it's friends, stay with people who believe in you. I think uh, having that supportive environment is really important. And of course, uh, whatever happens, uh, keep trusting in God and keep reading, you know, the Bible, uh, even for me, uh, a lot of encouraging verses uh, really encouraged me during my preparation. Of course, there are times when we face difficulties. Sometimes we feel that we won't be able to do this. Uh, and even if we reach one stage, the next stage seems harder or seems larger. But whatever it is, uh, I think uh, during these times, I think God remains our strength and our source of motivation also and our comfort also. So uh, I would uh, suggest that for you. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, uh, congratulations, Nen Kezo and Nen Azakum. Um, my question is, uh, as we have uh, heard from all of your stories, the aspiration came uh, early on in life. But there are some people uh, like myself whose aspiration came a little uh, later in life. For uh, example, like myself, I recently completed my master's and uh, got admitted in a uh, coaching institute, but we hear Mm, discouraging comments like it's too late, you started too late, you are too old, and you can never catch up. So, uh, <laughs> uh, my question is uh, what, uh, what suggestions do you have for people like me whose inspiration came a little later in life? I just want to say that uh, it's never too early or too late, and as long as you have that determination and that uh, willpower, that determination in you, then I really personally believe that it's never too late. And if you're really wanting to do this, and uh, if you're you know, taking the initiatives, taking the efforts to start now, then I think that uh, it's the perfect time to start now. And you have a whole lot of, many, a whole lot of years ahead of you. Now, uh, I, don't think, I personally don't think that it's late or that you're too old. So <laughs> I just want to say that it's the perfect timing. So don't let any such, uh, say, negative things or negative emotions uh, tend to just, you know, cloud, you, cloud your uh, vision. Sometimes when we're preparing, we tend to overthink a lot. And I also understand sometimes if it's not a big thing also, we tend to think that, oh, it's like this, it's so huge, or just overthinking some problems. So I just want to encourage you say, and say that uh, if you have the determination, that uh, fire or that zeal in you, then it's never too late. So that, that's what I want to say. There's a verse in the Bible that says the first will be last and the last will be first. I know it might not be appropriate for this context, but uh, it's not the same for everyone. For some, it's their childhood dream and then they can achieve it. Um, and then there are so many people who started, it's not, I, I wouldn't want to use the word late, but say it wasn't a childhood dream for them. And if I'm not mistaken, even Sergey Kul, the IPS, uh, who cleared last year, I think even for him, it was during his graduation days when the inspiration came. So. Um, like you said, not too late. <laughs> yeah, uh, brother, if you don't mind, I want to add something to that. Actually, um, <coughs> I did my PhD, no, not exactly did, I did PhD for five years, I submitted my first draft, and my supervisor said you have to put in a lot of more work. and. Working on my PhD for five years and then uh, saying that I have to continue uh, for PhD again, that was, I was already facing a lot of struggles. Huh? And I think I started my preparation for civil services uh, at 2019, after I had like put in five years of PhD work. Now I'm 3-3. Uh, recently I cleared uh, this uh, common ejection service and 
I think uh, you can see prelims also, and uh, I will be writing uh, names. No? So I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> um, I started my uh, UPC preparation in 29, and I intend to continue preparing even after I get married, if I don't clear now. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. That's, uh, that's the motivation I have. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to add that. And um, continue enough. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question of course. Um, congratulations to both of you. Yeah. Um, what are some uh, specific tips for men's answer writing do you have uh, for me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, especially now, when they ask a 10, 10 marks question, and the only point you can think of it, just one point, nah? and for 10 marks, like one point seems to be too less. So for that kind of questions, like, uh, what suggestions uh, do you give? Thank you. Uh, in means answer writing, yes, uh, the, the last question that you asked, uh, there are so many questions where we have very little idea. So uh, I think that it comes with practice. When we, when we keep on answer writing, we're having uh, a lot of practice giving tests, then it automatically comes that uh, when we have, say, one tip, one strategy is that uh, there's the introduction, body conclusion for uh, mains and search. So following that structure, uh, for the introduction, we can just give some basic idea about uh, the topic, even if we don't hit exactly on the, the nail, but if we just have some, say, a uh, little bit basic idea, then just give that basic, uh, very general introduction, and then for the body, uh, for means answer writing, people suggest writing in points. That's when we have a lot of points, but when we have only one point or two points, then I think uh, it's better to write in paragraph re paragraph form. So write in paragraphs, but also use uh, flowcharts just to consume the space, like uh, drawing diagrams and just enlarging your handwriting and just, <laughs> you know, creating an illusion that you know a lot. So. <laughs> Yeah, so just try to complete the page. But of course, we have to make sure that it's accurate and we're not giving some wrong information because if it's wrong information, then that creates a very negative impression. So whatever um, general knowledge you have, just write it down, but uh, highlight on that point that you know very well. So just write it in more points. And then if you have just basic uh, intro basic knowledge, then just like uh, write them in larger space so that uh, we, we tend to cover that uh, page and <clears throat> for uh, mains for 10 marks we have two pages so uh, initially in my first attempt I used to write only one and a half page or one and uh, say one quarter like that uh, I used to I, I could not complete the papers and I think that affected my marks also so in my second attempt I, I was writing an, a test series and I talked with one uh, faculty and he said my answers were okay but he told me to uh, fill the pages because what he said was that everyone, the evaluator is going to check everyone's papers. So if they're checking the papers and then everyone is completing the pages, but then they come across your page where you have completed only a half or one and a half page, then that creates a negative impression. So uh, just fill the pages. Uh, that's one thing I want to share also. And uh, say basics for answer writing. Uh, we have, for answer writing, we have. Uh, three things I think. First is content. We have to build on the content uh, just by reading the resources. And secondly, the structure, like the introduction, body, conclusion. I think we have to follow that. And uh, thirdly, the presentation also, like uh, having a good handwriting or, you know, just using flowcharts or if there are headings, then just putting boxes around that and using diagrams. They create a positive impression. So that would be uh, my strategy for uh, answer writing. And also joining, joining test series, test series and practicing a lot of answer writings, uh, going through topper's copies and just analyzing them. And uh, we also get a lot of good materials from topper's copies also. Like if we're given the same question and another topper is writing the same question, then we can just write our own points. But if we have missed out any points from, uh, that to from our answers, then we can add them from the topper's copies. So, uh, in my second attempt, especially uh, toppers, copies, was uh, really helpful for me. So my, that would be my strategy for answer writing. I 
I think Java has covered uh, everything. Uh, if you look at the PSC questions, then within the question, you can always divide it into subparts. And I think it's very important that you understand the demand of the question, and then you try to break it down into small parts. Uh, that's what I learned actually joining Tess is this. Um, it's, not, it's never a simple question in the PSC. There, there are always layers, so you have to identify that. So that way, it's like, uh, it, uh, like you said, if you have just one point, then those layers can cover up for the main point. Uh, and then I also follow the same thing, introduction, body, conclusion. I think another tip I would give is, and for me, I followed both paragraph and point format. Like it was very flexible. We didn't, I would start in paragraphs and then just, you know, give a subhead and then write in points and then conclude with a paragraph. So very flexible. There is no set, I think, uh, formula or something when it comes to answer writing. As long as you're answering, as long as it's correct, then that's it. And if you think that you don't have anything to write, you can always write way forward and give some suggestions. That's the, I think that, uh, if, especially I, I do that when I don't have much content. So even if the main point is very little, I fill it up with the, you know, um, the way forward or the suggestion that the government should do this, this, this. And in conclusion, try to end it with a very positive note that the government has done, 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 done this, this, this so much but say we still have a long way to go, something like that. That way, even if your main answer is just one paragraph or so, your answer is still full and you'll still get marks for that. And then again, she said, for first notes, uh, I just want to mention that for essay, you know, I refer to lots of proper copies and here is one, uh, Sir Vikram Grewal. I think his notes are also available online. And I remember just referring to his essay copies and then the next day uh, I could use his introduction and his data in my essay. So it's very helpful. Sometimes I make notes out of proper copy notes. So you can always do that. Good afternoon, ma'am. During preparation period, there are ups and downs for everyone. So what motivates you to keep going? And what are the qualities most needed for an essay? When it comes to motivation, that I think your reason to join the civil services, like why you want to join civil services, that should be very clear. You shouldn't just be following the crowd. Uh, for me, I faced so many failures, and it's during the course of my failure, I realized how much I wanted this. So the thought of giving up was more scarier than failure in itself. I was okay with failing as long as I had that fire to keep going. So why I wanted to join civil services, that was very clear in my mind. And I think uh, th that will be your, um, during those hard days, I think there are days when the external sources will help you, motivate you, and help you get through it. But there are days when nothing can even, you know, uh, inspire you. It's like you have to find that strength from the bottom of your heart. You have to find your strength within yourself. Um, and then when it comes to uh, what qualities, I think hard work, no one can deny that. A lot of discipline, a lot of uh, endurance. I think those are qualities you hear over and over again. But I think those would be the, I would just repeat the same in this. A lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of, uh, you know, the strength in you to never give up, that I will never give up attitude, just the ability to pick yourself up, of, uh, to pick yourself up over and over again, no matter how many times you fall. I think I'll let Jeffrey continue. I think my answer is also very much similar to uh, Sis Althea. Um, even for me, like she said, it's the same thing, internal motivation, external motiva motivation. So internal can be from yourselves. Uh, from like the, like she said the desire why you want to do it so it's the same thing but external motivation can also be from uh, mm -hmm. from pe from people around you from your parents from your friends who uh, who really want to see you uh, do this exam sometimes it may not be yourselves uh, who feel that uh, you can do it sometimes we tend to doubt ourselves but when people around you have that uh, expectations. When, have, when they have the belief in us, then that really motivates us to really prove them, prove their uh, expectations also. So that motivates us. And, uh, 
and then from the practical aspects also sometimes just going through toppers videos toppers stories of success or failure they also motivate us uh, and we believe that if they can do it then i can also do it because everyone has different stories so everyone faces different different uh, uh, roadblocks or challenges also so just hearing from others also motivates us and uh, regarding the second question about uh, what all qualities are required in a civil servant I think uh, firstly is the determination we really have need to have that determination and that very uh, strong target that this is something that I want to do and like she said not following the crowd but really targeting it knowing what you want and secondly uh, consistency just uh, making sure that you're preparing daily that uh, sometimes it's, a, it's not really about the intensity, but it's more about consistency. Sometimes uh, some people tend to study uh, for so many hours and then the next few days they might not study. So I think better than that, we have to just have that regular schedule, whether it's boring or very uh, monotonous also, just have that schedule and uh, be consistent. And thirdly, resilience. Whether, whenever we face failures or challenges, just be resilient and uh, stick to that goal. So I think those would be some qualities. Thank you. Uh, first of all, a big heartfelt congratulations to you, Ma'am Altula and Ma'am Wadawit, uh, for your remarkable achievements, and thank you for your time. Uh, I have two questions for Ma'am Wadawit. Uh, okay, this, uh, so the first question is, uh, public administration is your optional. Uh, what are the other sources that you would recommend other than the Rawls uh, Institute materials? And as an outsider, uh, can we uh, get hold of these Institute materials? That's the first question. Um, for public administration, uh, firstly, I'll just say that my sources were from the coaching notes. That's number one. And secondly, I joined this uh, Lukman IS test series. So from there, uh, I think like 60% of my preparation were from those uh, Lukman model test answers, uh, models, uh, model answers. I made notes from them and I kept revising them. So those are my two major sources. And of course the internet for any other uh, topics that are missed out. So regarding um, other book resources, as of now, since I didn't refer to other books so now I might not be having the list now, but uh, maybe later I'll just check them and I'll let you know, okay? And uh, yes, and uh, regarding the notes also, if uh, I think if you want my notes, my coaching notes, then you can always take them. Like you can just take a scanned copy. I have around three uh, notebooks of coaching institutes, my coaching notes. So uh, yeah, I think you can get them later also if you want. Mm -hmm. the other and the other question is, how did you manage uh, to prepare your optional subject in par with the GS papers? And uh, you know, how did you fit in the optional subject in your daily, weekly, monthly target charts? Thank you. Uh, for my coach, uh, for my optional preparation, uh, the thing is, I had taken coaching in 2020. So I remember uh, my coaching for GS started in. Uh, June 2020 and then my optional coaching started in October so uh, from October to March I had uh, coaching for around that's five to six months or something so uh, during that time uh, for my coaching we used to have two classes two hours classes daily so that somehow uh, got fit into my schedule but after that uh, I started giving my uh, first attempt so there in my mains preparation I made sure that in the first month of my preparation for mains, we get three months uh, after prelims, between prelims and mains. So in the first month, I made sure that I completed my optionals. And then after that, in my second and third month, I would be focusing on GS papers. But during that second and third month, I joined test series. So from that test series, uh, I used to have tests every week. So whatever I had studied in the first month, uh, my notes were there, but uh, every week I used to give tests and I used to devote say a few hours to give the test and analyze and make my own notes from the model answers. So that was how I was able to uh, manage my time for optionals. Mm
my question is, after being employed, how did you balance your time in preparation? I haven't been employed for long, so I might not be the right person to tell you. My training started in January. So by that time, UPSC main was already done, and I, I just had to prepare for interview. Uh, so I think I really can't help you there. Even for me speaking, because um, results were declared in November 2022, so uh, for me, I had taken leave from uh, police training. So that's why uh, I, had, I got time to prepare. So uh, I didn't have that uh, problem. So maybe somebody else would uh, be able to answer that question.
uh, spectrum book, they, that was also very understandable. And for economy, uh, though I did not refer, but uh, that a lot of my friends also read uh, this Ramesh Singh economy, Indian economy, and then for science and for environment subjects, I think the NCRT textbooks are, uh, are sufficient, I believe. But if there are any extra topics, then we have to refer to current affairs and also uh, go through uh, internet and YouTube channels. So I think those would be my sources for um, preparing just from the basics. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my first question is, uh, how was your UBC interview experience? Can you please tell us more? Member one and I, we got the same bill this year, Sir Alan Chobe. Uh, so I've given two interviews. I can just share with you the difference between the first interview and the second interview. Although I wasn't able to improve my marks that significantly, uh, there was a little bit of um, improvement. Mm, the thing about UPSC interview is that uh, I think it's not as uh, complicated or not as terrifying as we imagine. The board members are very experienced senior members who wants to know you. Uh, and for that, you have to, you know, I think that if you really want to have a fruitful interaction, then you shouldn't be scared. You, sh you should be at peace, be very confident about why you want this, where you came from. And uh, they don't expect you to know everything that's given. So they just want to hear your opinions and your thoughts. And I think in the first interview, that's where I failed. I was so scared. I was so timid. And again, I mean, you must have seen, I'm not very loud also, I'm not very expressive also. So in the first interview, um, my they were very cold, they were very kind. But the environment was such that because of COVID, you know, there was so much distance. I had to wear masks. On top of that, I'm not very loud. So I think I couldn't make myself heard. I think that would be the drawback uh, that I had. And I was, again, too nervous. This interview, I was actually quite satisfied because I tried to work on those mistakes and um, Sir Arun Chobe, again, very cordial board, uh, very understanding because he gives a long monologue before your interview starts. He'll tell you to relax and not to be worried and not to be, you know, they just want to know you, they are your friends. I think he says that to every single one. So they made me feel very relaxed and this time, because of my previous experience, I was a lot more comfortable. Uh, and when, again, this time I, I told myself that I was going to speak, like, I will just speak. It doesn't matter whether what I'm saying is right or wrong. At least I will tell them what's in my heart. And I think the kind of questions they ask you is also very important. And for me, the questions were very diverse. There were questions, I, I cannot recall all the questions now, I'm sorry, because it's been some time, but um, questions from agriculture, I think we were asked the same questions. <laughs> we, our interview was just a few days apart. We were asked the same questions based on agriculture the Green Revolution, and uh, and then there were questions from my subject, which was history, also my graduation subject, uh, and then questions from Nagaland also, like um, a lot of development, a lot of money is being poured into the Northeast, but um, we cannot see the results on the ground, so why the reasons for all those? Um, trying to recollect, but I'm not able to remember. There were also questions about my uh, uh, questions from history subject, and then questions about, okay, like how COVID impacted our education, and also how COVID impacted our, uh, the employment scenario, like all over India, as well as in uh, Nagaland. So those are some of the questions I can recollect, but overall, it's a very friendly, they don't really grill you, like I wasn't grilled as such, they were very patient. That's one of the thing difference between um, the mock interviews that you give and then that you see on YouTube channel. They try to grill you, and sometimes they're not very patient to hear you out. But the real interview, they just take you can just take your time. So like they are there to listen to you and hear what you have to say. So overall, this was it was a good experience. Uh, I don't have any complaints about the marks also. Just happy. Yeah. From my experience. Uh, my, in my first and second experience also. In my first uh, interview, I remember 
uh, being not confident. So I had not prepared because to be honest, I just cleared mains by just around 10 marks and I wasn't expecting to clear mains. So I was focusing on preparing for NPSC. So I didn't get time to prepare for not, uh, for interview and interview is not something that you just go and give the, give you just something that you enter and then just speak out. We have to prepare a lot for interview. So that's what I realized. So my preparation in my first attempt was not adequate and that really affected my confidence also. So uh, I got, in my first attempt also, I got RN Chobaser. And I remember, uh, I think they also noticed that I was a fresh candidate. I mentioned that it was my first attempt. So they asked me just uh, very basic questions about my, uh, say, about uh, my background. They just asked me factual questions from civil engineering. Like the moment I entered, uh, he gave, gave some very basic introduction, like the monologue that she was saying. And then uh, just started asking me questions from civil engineering, like very technical questions. So that put me off initially. And um, my inter first interview was not that very that much satisfactory, but the noticeable difference that I saw in my second attempt was in my second uh, interview, the questions were more analytical. In the first interview, they were more factual, like what is this, what is that? But in the second interview, they were more about what do you think or what is the reason? I remember some questions like, um, um, what, uh, what is the reasons for the poor conditions of road in Netherlands? Because I'm from civil engineering background and from Netherlands, so they combine those two together. So the questions are from our background. And uh, they also ask some current affairs questions, like uh, some protests going on in Iran. So they asked me, uh, do you know, what do you know about uh, Mahasa Anini? She's, she's a lady uh, uh, involved with that. So those questions, and then they asked me, what is the meaning of your name? And uh, another thing is, um, uh, there's uh, I've been to Northeast, and uh, the weaving there, the traditional handloom, these uh, artisans, it's not uh, very successful. So what is the reason? So they asked me some more questions where I could actually explain and be more analytical in my answers also. And uh, another thing is that bo boards tend to vary from person from person to person. So. Uh, some boards are very cordial and friendly. They ask you just questions from uh, from your background, from your hobbies. But in our case, the board that we got was uh, quest asking questions from very diverse backgrounds. And in my case also, I think it was a stress interview because uh, as I was answering the board members, uh, there were four or five members. So when I had finished the first four members and I was moving on to the fifth member, the chairman started Tearing the paper just like that, <laughs> and just very roughly, I think it was to check my reaction, and I realized that it must have been a stress interview. So I'm not sure that uh, whether they did that with others, but he just took the paper and then just started tearing it like that, like very roughly, three, four times. So I, from there itself, I just felt that okay, maybe they're doing this deliberately. So I tried to keep my calm, and uh, my my interview marks also were quite satisfactory from my own uh, perspective. So that's uh, my interview experience. Last two questions. Last two questions. <laughs> okay, in continuation question, what was the one interview question uh, to which you, you wish you had responded differently? Um, so I was asked like what um, how would your friends describe you? And then how would people who don't like you describe you? And up to this day, I don't know what I answered. <laughs> I started it out. So I don't know how, would I, how I would respond differently, but I guess when you're asked questions like this, then you really need to take your time. The presence of mind becomes very important. And then it's actually an opportunity to really share who you are. But for me, I was just doubled up, <laughs> just like that. So I think I, that would be one regret that I have. For me, I, I'm not able to recall the, all the questions, so um, sorry, I don't think I'll be able to answer it now. I'll have to think about it later. Well, hello. Uh, first of all, very happy uh, to have seen you both succeed in the GPC exam. And I just have um, a question for both of you. Uh, I start, started my uh, preparation several months ago, and then I've been hearing that we have to give at least 20 mock tests before the prelims. So
So what is the suggestion from mock test? How many mock tests do we have to give before the uh, release? For both UPSC and MPSC? I think there's no specific number of mock tests. And uh, from, from my personal experience also, I think 30 is a little much. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it depends from person to person. Uh, if you're, it depends on how much you're scoring. If you're scoring uh, sufficient, if you're scoring above the cutoff, then I think you don't need to give, keep giving tests. Uh, but if you still have a lot to improve, then you can keep giving tests. It just, it really depends on what, uh, what you require and your own personal uh, requirement. But uh, from this test series, I think, uh, more important is that we have to learn from them and make notes from them and see where we're making uh, mistakes or where our, where our weak areas are. So uh, there's no set number of tests, I believe. In my second uh, prelims attempt, I remember giving only eight full-length tests because I didn't get time. So it really depends on how much time you have or what level of preparation you've already done. So uh, it's really up to the individual. We, uh, I think uh, no, there shouldn't be any say number of uh, tests that we have to give. I'll just, I'll just add to that. Uh, <clears throat> for NPSC, I really cannot say anything, but for, N for UPSC, even when it comes to test series, there are tests for specific subjects and for specific portions. Uh, like if you follow Vision IS or most of the test series, it's like it's divided into subjects. And then within the subjects also, it's divided into topics. And then there are full length tests. So I think you have to decide for yourself. If you're already strong in polity, you're going to have to give so much of polity tests. Mm -hmm. If you're weak in art and culture, then maybe you can focus on that. So you can pick selectively and then just make sure that you're giving uh, full length tests, at least you know two to three full length tests, like a complete syllabus. So apart from that, uh, like she said, I don't think I have attempted 30 tests in like one, one attempt. Since I've given many attempts, the number of tests I've given has gone up, but in one attempt, Maybe maximum would be like around 20. So I think you can choose accordingly. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me some real answer to the question. My question uh, would be regarding gather allocation. Since you guys are going to be placed in a new state, uh, how are you, how, as a woman, how are you going to get the talents? And more to break the barriers of society and maybe from a spiritualistic uh, society. So, how are you going to test those challenges? I think uh, since we're giving UPSC and it's an all India exam and we're aspiring for all India services, so uh, as aspirants, especially UPSC aspirants, when we're preparing, we just uh, condition ourselves that we have to be prepared to be working all over India, otherwise we would have given a state exam. But if it's UPSC, then it's an all India exam. So in the first step, I think we have to be prepared mentally that uh, wherever I am placed, uh, we're not just working for one state or for one community or for one region, but we're working for the whole of our country and for our whole country's development. So in the first place, we have to be mentally prepared for that. So even, me, even for me now, uh, cadre allocation is not out now, but um, um, I'll be happy with, uh, you know, whichever state that I get. I'm sure that uh, whatever it is, it will be uh, a God's plan. Tell us about your table tennis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, table tennis, uh, I started playing table tennis uh, since, um, I think, I started joining tournaments in class 6 onwards. So uh, when we were young, we used to have a table tennis board at home. And uh, my dad, he's also a very uh, in, in enthusiastic sports uh, person. So uh, we grew up learning table tennis at home. And uh, me and four of my siblings also, uh, we used to play together. So uh, in 2008 onwards, we started playing table tennis. And uh, um, in the state level, I think, yes, in 2010, I think uh, I got Nagaland champion in table tennis. And, and uh, even my siblings also we used to play table tennis tournaments together. So it's become like a um, family tradition also, I think, just playing at home. And even in colleges also, we joined uh, tournaments in our colleges and played tournaments also. So yeah, that's been my table tennis journey so far. And <laughs> even 
uh, for my preparation, I couldn't get time to prepare for table, uh, to play table tennis. <laughs> Table tennis, but uh, yes, in the near future, I'm planning to return to it again. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, here is another question Were you guys in relationship <laughs> in the process of your preparation? <laughs> yeah. Anyone of you? I'll speak on behalf of both of us, we were just speaking earlier. Um, it's a little too personal, so I think we would not like to go into that. But when it comes to relationship or dating or as such, if you look at the story of many experienced and toppers, there are people who are married, mar uh, with children and also career the exam, people who are in relationship, dating, preparing to get a career together, uh, the IS toppers like Kanisha, he also thanks his girlfriend. So I think it's very personal, very individual. Um, you will know it better than anyone else whether you need to hold on to or whether you need to let it go. So I don't think we have any particular advice as such there. You just have to make your decisions. The only thing or the only concern we had, and we were speaking earlier, uh, if it works out, great. But if it doesn't, then you'll be heartbroken. And it's not good to study with a broken heart. So. <laughs>